Hello and welcome once again to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. Things are starting to warm up outside, so if you've got a question, give us a call at 472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. You can also send us emailed questions for future show. That address is byf at unl.edu. If you don't tell us where you live, I have to ask you. That makes me mad. So attach your pictures as a JPEG also, please. During the week, you can check us out on our social media network. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. With that out of the way, Jonathan, sample, sample is time. yours first. Okay, cool. I brought with me one of my little arachnid friends here today. This is a woodlouse hunter. They were pretty famous last year in the fall because somebody started an internet hoax about them <clears throat> using some University of Nebraska pictures, actually. The reason that this hoax got started is because they have these really big fangs on the front of their cephalothorax, on the front of their head. And these chelicera they use to eat their favorite food, which is the woodlouse or the pill bug that you see over there. Uh, roly poly, some people call them. They'll eat millipedes, they'll eat silverfish, they'll even eat each other with those big fangs. I think that they're pretty cool looking because they have kind of a red head and then a khaki bottom, so they look like they work at Target. And they are just a really fun spider. I like having them around. They're not a medical hazard. They are not the newest, deadliest spider or whatever the hoax said. They pose very little hazard to people. So if you see them, don't bother them. They are aggressive, but they're not gonna do anything to you. But you have the picture. I do of have, do you wanna see the, the big jaws? Do I hold them up over there? <laughs> right there? So look at the size of those things, like a forklift on your face. Shovels that food right in its maw. I think it's pretty cool. These are taken by Jim Kalish. Who used awesome. To be on the show, yeah. Awesome. So just because he retired doesn't mean we can't. Oh no, use he took the best expertise. picture. So yeah. <laughs> what does All a right. squashed one look like? A squashed one? Uh, there's just like goo everywhere. Yeah. Do you want to find out here? <laughs> okay, uh, Matt. Dandelion. Yes, dandelion. That's I brought in actually two different dandelions. Um, the one here on my left. Uh, is actually one that got treated with 2,4-D last fall. So obviously the fall is the best time to treat um, most of our broad broadleaf weeds or winter annuals. And this one was kind of on the edge of the pot. They got barely treated. That's why it's not completely dead. But you can see that it's not greening up. It's not emerging new foliage. Uh, it's having a tough time. And you can see that the reason why we do apply in the fall is because it has an, a deep taproot. I didn't even get the whole thing. It probably would have been about seven to 10 inches. Uh, this is about four to five of it. Uh, so that's really, most of the plant is below ground. And when we're treating in the spring, what we see is basically this green, this green top hat that I got in this jar here. Uh, and dandelions are really starting to bloom now and given another two to three weeks and we're gonna be in peak bloom. Uh, so it's that weed and feed season. Uh, and what we're trying to do is get uh, our chemical activity through these leaves and work their way down into the taproot. So uh, you want to make sure that you're applying products that work well and also applying them at the appropriate times. Uh, you don't want them to be droughty. You want them to have adequate moisture. And if you're using, uh, let's say, the weed and feed granular products, you want to make sure that they're wet when you apply and that they stay on the foliage for at least 24 hours. And that's going to help efficacy and actually get you better control. If you apply it when it's dry and windy, uh, it's not going to do its job. You might see some wilting and you'll wonder why these weeds are coming back. So. Just make sure you do the best and read the label. Excellent, thank you, Matt. All right, Lauren, you win the prize for the one that won't fit on the table. <laughs> I just, just didn't do enough pruning on my sample tonight. And, uh, <laughs> I was pruning out in the landscape earlier this week and uh, brought some of the samples in from that effort. Uh, great time to do some cleanup. Uh, while you're out there, uh, things are starting to green up. Any of those dead branches on a lot of our shrubs and trees uh, really great sources of inoculum. So I don't know how close we can get here on this one. So this is just a dead twig. Uh, but between my fingers, I don't know how zoomed up we can get there. You can see all those little black specks. Okay, now those are fruiting structures from the Cytospora fungus, which causes Cytospora canker on yellow twig and red twig dogwood. So then I'm gonna pull this up. I could have printed this off, but it's too fun to bring a giant sample. So you can see <laughs> all these different little brown areas that are initial infections from this. And so as this continues, this branch will die and then we'll have these infection sites that then produce more fruiting structures. So uh, really important, just a, another example of just using sanitation to do a great job of disease management 
uh, just encourage you as things are coming up and, and you have those branches that are dead or dead twigs on them, go ahead and prune them out. So if somebody put those in their wood chipper, would you just spread it around? Yeah, so if you were chipping this uh, without any composting, absolutely, you would still have that. So if you put it in your chipper and you put it under the, the shrub that was susceptible, so again, here we're talking about dogwoods, you would you would have more disease. All right, Absolutely. Excellent. Thank good you, thing to get rid of. All right, John, we're all hungry, so it's a good thing you brought that, right? It is. <laughs> So, uh, you know, hiding here behind my pot, you know, howdy ho neighbor, you know, <laughs> hiding. <laughs> they told me to do that back there. So uh, yeah, right. Don't yell at me, right? Uh, so uh, I brought this container that I uh, stole from uh, a front porch. Luckily it was my own. Uh, and uh, it's an attractive container, but everything in here is edible. Uh, and so I have uh, lots of different lettuces. Uh, there's pansies, which are edible flowers, uh, and some kale uh, that will pop up there some Swiss chard, uh, so lots of different things. And the reason that I brought this is that this is a good alternative uh, for folks that might be in flood areas mm -hmm. because we've been telling people to, uh, to wait to plant things or to harvest things because of food safety risks. And so they're not gonna be able to do their early season gardening and maybe not even later if they want to postpone that. So container gardening is a good tasty alternative. Excellent. <laughs> and that's truly not fair because we can't reach. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's give you, Jonathan, the first picture. Um, she says this is a bur oak, started a few years ago, sort of this growth on the tree. <clears throat> it's now taken over the whole tree. We don't okay. know where she is from. Okay, so with oaks, we get lots and lots of galls on those plants. They're the most popular choice for a lot of these gall-making wasps and flies and things. So when I look at this, my, there's a few things that pop into my head. There could be horned oak gall, could be gouty gall. Uh, there's also the possibility of it being a rough bullet gall, rough oak bullet gall. That one is more common on burr oaks, but I don't see the shapes that I would assume with that. So that usually looks like all these little Hershey kisses glued together. This looks more like gouty gall, which I've not seen on burr oak before. So I'd like to hear more about this particular problem. If it is any of those galls, there's not a lot that you can do. Usually they're just kind of a curiosity as we've talked about before. The best thing for you to do is try and thin some of those out this summer and then next summer and then the summer after that and just take care of the tree and hopefully it bounces back. Fall sanitation, burning up those twigs that you cut out, taking those leaves away, that's all gonna help as well to cut down the population. But treatments are not really available for this for homeowners to do on their own. Especially on a big tree. <clears throat> big tree, yeah, that would be yeah. very difficult to do. All right, thank you. All right, this is a Lincoln viewer, Matt. A um, couple pictures that are a little pixelated, but you can right. see all the dead and the brown and kind of funky little spots. He does say the turf is starting to grow back. He's gonna seed some of the bare areas after he dethatches, but he's wondering if we have any idea why this might have happened or what to do about it. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of different things that could have happened, and it's kind of tough to tell by the pictures. They're kind of far away, but uh, there's just thin spots, and if it's coming out of the winter like this, it could have just been some snow mold or something if there was snow piles there, or it could have been stress from last summer, uh, and there's just areas that died out, and it could even been annual grassy weeds that you thought were grass last year and they died out and now they're not growing back. Um, so what we could do is try and introduce some new seed into the area. Uh, make sure you don't put a pre-emergent down. And if you do, use one that's safe on seedings, um, one that contains mesotrione maybe, and that would prevent some of the crabgrass to come, from coming back if that is what was in there. Uh, so it's kind of tough telling, but it could have been a number of things, but you just want to make sure that you have <coughs> adequate moisture there if there is grass there. So it might still be greening up. Uh, we're still pretty early in the season. So uh, I'd say give it a little time, but it wouldn't hurt to introduce some seed. All right. Thank you, Matt. All right, Lauren, this is a viewer who had uh, Easy Elegance roses, and she was told they were infected with witch's broom. Uh, they were to dig them up and destroy and they did that. They now need to know whether the soil is contaminated. Can they plant new ones? Since we've never really heard of witches' brooms, we think maybe it was rosette. Yeah, so this is, a, uh, this is most likely rose rosette. And, mm -hmm. and it kind of depends on what they want the roses to look like. Some people may like them to look like that. <laughs> um, and they all but, will, right? Yeah, right. They'll, they'll all look like that. So this is an example of something to rogue out. When you have it, it sounds like they've done this correctly. Um, it's a great time though to assess in that landscape as, as plants are coming up. If you're seeing distorted growth, 
really important to take those out because you will gradually spread them through your landscape with pruning. Uh, and then as far as in the soil, I'm not too worried about that being in the soil, so you should be able to, to uh, go ahead and, and replan into that area. Uh, not an issue there, but make sure you're removing that plant material if you have it, because if you keep it in the landscape, even in a compost area or something, there's a potential for those thrips to be there and move that. All right, thanks, Lauren. All right, John, this is a viewer uh, who has a dwarf peach, and she planted it last spring, came back beautifully. There's a large sucker growing out of the base. She wants to know when to prune and when she should expect fruit and what she should do about the sucker. So kind of three questions there. Okay, where do we start here? Yeah. Uh, so uh, number one, the sucker needs to be pruned out as soon as possible. I would say that is probably been caused by planting too deep uh, because we, we have the the, the graft union there, and so there's probably something going on there. Uh, so that's a possibility. It's also, even though it is a dwarf peach, it is planted too close to the house that we could tell from the picture. Uh, so, you know, that's that's a tough one. You would have to keep it really pruned down. If it's been relative, if it's just been planted in the last year or so, you might be able to, to move it uh, a little further away from the house if you want to. It is too late to do the, the actual tree pruning. Uh, this year, uh, we're, we're beyond that point, so you would want to, uh, to do that next year. You want to do that late winter, so that's between, say, mid-February to, to mid-March. Sometime in there, you want to do that. And as to when to expect fruit, uh, usually dwarf trees take um, anywhere from three to five years to start producing, uh, so you could see some production there. If you only get a few in the first year, it might be more beneficial to take them off rather than let them form so that then you you can keep forming those roots and let the tree establish a little bit more. Excellent, thanks John. Well, people don't like icy driveways or sidewalks during the winter, so of course we throw down some sort of ice melt after we've scooped that snow. But our turf specialist Bill Kreuzer said we should have been careful. Those grains might have taken care of the ice, but they probably cause salinity issues on your lawn this year. So here's Bill to tell us more about that. After a tough winter like this, we get a lot of questions about salt-affected soils. In the winter, we use products like sodium chloride or table salt to lower the freezing point of the ice and snow and cause it to melt. But all that salt then goes into our soils and it can make it very difficult for the plants to access water. In some cases, there's so much salt can be present, it can actually suck the water out of the plant and kill it. There's been a lot of alternatives that have been released lately that contain things like calcium, magnesium, and even beet juice. But all these products are still salts and they can all still have negative consequences on our plants in the spring. So what should we do about it to try to get our plants to regrow and recover? So these ice melt products can lead to two problems in our soil. The first is salinity. Salinity is just how much salt is in the soil. And again, when we get a lot of salt in the soil, it makes it very hard for the plants to access water. This happens every time we have dog spots or even in the summer if we over fertilize our lawn and we have some fertilizer burn. It's a salt problem. The second issue is sodicity. Sodicity is when you get a high level of sodium in our soil, particularly our fine textured soils, and it causes them to lose pore space that allows air and water to go and make our roots be healthy. So it's really only an issue in our fine textured soils. If you're one of those fortunate viewers in the sand hills or have lawns with sandy soil, you don't really ever have to worry about sodicity. So how do we fix these issues? If we have a saline soil, the only thing we can do is try to leach the salt below the plant roots. And in the spring, normal spring rain and snow melt generally does a good job of this. But if we're still having some problems, do a soil test. If a soil test says you still have salinity issues, then a little bit of extra irrigation can help to push that salt below. Uh, just a thing to note though, uh, you never want to use softened water because water softened with salt can intensify the problem. 
If you have sodic soils, then we need to apply gypsum because the gypsum actually displaces the sodium and helps to again, again push it below our roots. The gypsum is only going to help if you have sodic soils. If you have compaction from, say, an automobile or from pet traffic, putting gypsum down is not going to help unless you have a sodic situation. If you have a saline situation, adding gypsum actually makes it worse because gypsum is in itself a salt. Finally, once you fix these issues, then it's a time we can resod and we can reseed, and with a little bit of time and some patience, we can have a good looking lawn and landscape again. So you can see it's not an impossible problem if you've got those soils with salt or sodicity issues around the edges of the sidewalk and the driveway. But as Bill said, it's really best to avoid it if you can. This wasn't exactly a winter for avoidance. Mm -hmm. Lots of salt. <laughs> Lots of salt. <laughs> Lots of snow. Either that or a lot of broken limbs, probably. <laughs> that too. All right, so your next picture is an old tree that is dying and that is full of holes. Uh, she calls them wood bees. Okay. Um, and. Um, it sure they're... is full of holes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, it looks like somebody used a drill and went to town on the poor tree. Yes, it does. So there could be a few different things at play here. First of all, I would say this tree is done for. I, I would yeah. really consider taking this out. There's not a lot of hope for it because some of the things that I'm seeing here, some of it looks like carpenter ant damage possibly. I don't see a lot of sawdust on the ground, but I would guess that some of this came from them. They will take advantage of any dead portion of a tree that they can. There also look to be some round headed borer damage. These are beetles that as a larva, they have really round heads. Entomologists like we've been discussing forever are not very creative, so they're very simple. So if they have a round head, we call them a round headed borer. They also like to take advantage of dead and decaying wood, so firewood type situations usually. And there also look to maybe be some carpenter worm holes. They look like they're really big holes. I'd like to see some scale for that if you could have a quarter next to it or something. But for all of those, for carpenter worms, you can spray. That would be like a pyrethroid on the trunk here in the next month or so. But the others, that's mostly just getting rid of the tree that's affected. And you don't really have any other recourse because they're just taking advantage of a poor situation for the plant. All right. I'll go Sorry there. about your tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really unfortunate when we have to tell people that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt, this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, she has an area about two feet in diameter that's sort of this yellowish mixed with green, not near the street. She doesn't think it is from ice yeah. melt or salt. She wonders if it'll just green up or should they pull it up, dig it out, reseed. And she said there is no pre merge there. So. Okay, that's what I was wondering. It looks like almost, I mean, sometimes when you see these little round spots, it's something that was sitting on the grass. Let's say it's debris, leaf matter, or something that was inhibiting that grass from growing, and then all of a sudden it surged out, and that's why it's kind of bleached. Uh, that's, that's my uh, opinion on what that could be. Uh, otherwise, it's some iron deficiency, which I don't know if it's not all over the lawn, uh, it's probably not that if it's just a couple patches. So I would say wait, uh, and it's probably going to grow out of it. Usually when that spring flush comes, sometimes it grows too fast and it, it turns a little yellow or whitish. So All I right. just say give it a little time and it probably will correct itself. Okay, thanks, Matt. Okay, Lauren, this is a, a beautiful American linden, like full grown, big, beautiful. But there has been this oozing crack in the mm -hmm. so there's the big tree. There's this oozing crack in the trunk. It's been that way for about the past two to three years. Does look like it leaves out. But any thoughts on this? Well, long term, this is probably going to end up like Jonathan's scenario with the other one. Mm -hmm. um, anytime we see these injured areas and, and wet wood, what we'd refer to this as, uh, typically in Many times we'll see it in tree crotches or, or cavities. Um, there's actually some sort of rot going on there where we've got a, uh, an organism living there that's, that's producing that sap exudation, typically. So long term, I would just really watch it. Uh, it's not something that you need to take care of immediately. There's not any treatment for it. Uh, but, but I would just be careful that it doesn't become a hazard tree. All right, thanks, Lauren. John, this is a Sioux City viewer who lives on the bluffs overlooking the river. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a shrub untended for decades probably, and the landscape, hardscape needs repair. There's erosion. She wants to know what, what these are. Can they be restored? Should they rogue them out? Uh, and what are they? 
Uh, so those uh, evergreens, there's a few issues with those. Uh, looks like uh, number one, they, they're planted too close to the fence. They're, they're, they're budding right up against the fence. And I would say looking at you know, the, the base of those, we all, a lot of times get on the evergreens, uh, the, the bottom branches sort of, they die out, they, they lose their needles because of the shading from above and as they age. So they're not really, they're not gonna really to green back out and they're not like other things that if you prune them, they, they flush back out the growth. So they're, they're basically, they're not gonna get any better than what they are right now. So <laughs> if you don't like them now, then you're not, gonna to like be, them. you're not gonna like it in the future. Uh, so you basically just have to, to get rid of those, you know. So you do pruning with a chainsaw or with a shovel uh, and uh, then you, you find something else to replace it. A little farther away from the fence, or something that is at least shade tolerant under those. Yes, streets. at least at least something shade tolerant. Yeah, right? a downer. It's an down. opportunity, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay, lots like of this opportunity. Yeah. This, <laughs> this segment's a little bit of a downer. Yeah. Can we get something you know, a little nicer We're next time around? We're going to be talking around? about the right. garden. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, you know, preparations are still being made for the gardening season, of course, by everybody. So we haven't got a lot to show you in the garden, but there are some tulips gracing the borders that are in full color right now. Let's take a minute to visit the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're actually gonna be able to step outside. We've had some halfway decent weather here in Lincoln and we are anxiously awaiting to kind of move some of those plants out. However, they're not quite ready and it's not quite warm enough for all those plants that we saw last week in the greenhouse. So we're just gonna take a check out and kind of get some of the finished cleanup done. We've cleaned out all of our containers, took out all of that old soil that we left in there over the winter. Remember, that has a lot of that debris from those plants last year. So you wanna actually add new soil to your containers. And we are just looking around. We're adding compost out of our compost back onto the garden beds. And we're just looking at all the pretty stuff that's coming up this spring. Just like our red and white tulips are flowing down along our rain chain garden. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out what's blooming in the garden this spring. Well, as Terry said, you know, with the warmer weather, we've got our compost incorporated into the soil. We will be ready to go soon. You might take a little note from our progress. Do the same for your garden soil at home. That makes a humongous difference. And I was talking to somebody last night who said, do I really have to take the soil out of my container? Yeah, at least part of it. <laughs> All right, so just questions, okay. Jonathan. Um, this is a viewer who has lots of bagworms. He's in the Utan area. Okay. And uh, wondering, since the winter was so cold, would the cold have killed some of them so they're not so bad? He knows you have to spray. He's not sure with what or when. All right. So starting with the cold, yes, uh, bagworms are susceptible to some of these cold temperatures that we've had. Research at Purdue showed that if they're exposed to negative 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 straight hours, which I think we achieved at, that, at this winter, this past winter here in Nebraska, then a lot of the bagworm eggs do freeze. They overwinter as an egg. So we may see a reduction in their population this year. It is distinctly possible. If you wanna go ahead and be cautious and spray, a good biopesticide for that is BT. It's sold under lots of different trade names. You'd apply that in late May, early June, depending on the next couple of weeks of weather. If it gets really warm really fast, late May. If it doesn't, go ahead and do it in early June. That gets the little bagworms as they start building up in the tree. All right, excellent. So there is hope. There is hope. <laughs> and Jack Frost may have done something for us. There we go. Make us ice, ice up our <laughs> salt Ruin water. our lawns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, uh, we have a lot of people wondering about the pros and cons of aerating versus <laughs> power raking and the timing for either of those. Okay, well, for aerating, the timing would be if you have compaction, you want to aerate. Uh, aeration is going to help uh, relieve some of that uh, compacted soil allowing nutrients and water to flow through the pro, uh, soil profile. So anytime you area it, you're helping the soil, especially if you have compaction, I would say it doesn't matter when you do it as long as you get it done and that's going to help the turf in the long run. Uh, as far as uh, power raking goes, if you do have a thatch problem, then it's going to be important to try and get rid of some of that thatch. So power raking would be necessary, uh, but just to do it just because if you don't have thatch, there's really no reason to, and it's, it's really no benefit 
unless you have a thatch problem. All right, so aerating two times a year, is that too much? No, I would say okay. you could do the spring and fall, and especially if you have a small lawn, let's say, and it's getting compacted from kids or from just walking paths, it's always good to alleviate that, and it doesn't hurt to do it twice a year. Okay, excellent, thanks, Matt. Okay, Lauren, this is an Omaha viewer who has flocks with powdery mildew, so I'm guessing it was the tall garden flocks and it was mm -hmm. last year. Uh, she has thinned the stand and she wants to know if she can spray to prevent that powdery mildew and if so, with what? Well, there's a couple things I'd recommend. So the first thing is by thinning and doing anything you can to change the microclimate on that, that's gonna help. Uh, powdery mildew also does respond to overhead irrigation. So watering overhead can reduce powdery mildew. And then finally, if you want to spray, um, there would be several products on the, on, in the garden market that you could do. Powdery mildews also respond to sulfur. If you wanted to say organic, you could use a sulfur spray. Or you could select a phlox that is resistant. That would be even better. <laughs> Which is even better. So you better. could look for resistance. Or if you're going to reestablish, that yeah. would be actually the first thing. Yeah, you there are some do now. If you have an opportunity to, pretty resistant. to reestablish that. Cool, good. All right, thank you. John, um, this is a viewer near Prairie Home. They pruned their grapes too late this year and they're losing sap. And they're wondering, uh, will it kill the vines? Is there anything they can do for their grape vines? So I think, uh, so losing some sap would be a normal response for pruning too late. I don't think uh, that it's going to kill the, the plant. It will maybe stunt it a little bit if it has been a, a lot of loss of sap. But otherwise, I don't think it's gonna be a problem. There's really nothing to do to, to, to help the plant. I mean, it, it'll just heal up and it will stop normally. Uh, so, you know, just the only thing is don't prune it so late next year. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are you ready, gentlemen? Yes. And okay. <laughs> so, John, this is a Murdoch viewer <clears throat> who has asparagus that came up four feet from their treated wood light pole. Can they eat that asparagus? I think they can. Uh, so if it's, it's if it's treated like for uh, pressure treated, that's fine. If it's creosote, I think it's still fine. It won't take that up. All right, excellent. This is a Long Island, Kansas viewer, <clears throat> wondering if you can eat dandelions, violets, and marigolds. Absolutely. Have a have a salad. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so when when should we expect the last frost or freeze? And does it vary from part of the state to part of the state. We will have the last frost or freeze when we have the last frost or freeze. <laughs> uh, and it does vary from places, place to place. So it could be from, you know, late April to early May all the way through later May, depending on usually in Nebraska, the farther west or north you go, the, the later it is. Excellent. Is it okay to use pine needles around mm -hmm. blueberries? This is a Syracuse viewer. So your blueberries definitely need acid. It's it's really hard to grow them here because of that. Uh, pine needles don't really affect the, the the acid in the soil that much. There nice job. <clears throat> but my guess is you forgot the word lightning. They were yeah. great, Anthony. Eh? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's Lauren. He's rubbing off on Well, it he's only going to get two. This time. <laughs> two really two. thorough life cycle <laughs> answers right. tonight. I'm ready. Are you ready? Okay, this is a York viewer, Lauren, who had uh, red spots on their strawberry leaves, and they're wondering, will that affect the fruit? Uh, most likely not, um, depending on what it is, but most of our foliar diseases, strawberry, stay there. Botrytis would be one that could affect the fruit, so I wouldn't worry about it. All right, is there a systemic that you can use for diseases of shrub roses? Yes. <laughs> we, we have an Aurora viewer <laughs> who had tomatoes that you. had a blight. <laughs> so uh, she wants to know what to do this year about that. Uh, mulch the plants, make sure you're used to sanitation, avoid, avoid overhead irrigation, and try to maintain them so you have an open canopy. All right. Is there a good resource so that a person can educate themselves on which fungi are edible more than once? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what can be done about needle cast in spruces right now or soon? Cut it out and grow something else. <laughs> Is there anything we can do for oak wilt right now? Ooh, um, I'm going to say no. <laughs> I won't take that one. Uh, there are resources. There's a, a fungi, the Great Plains. That's a great resource for edible fungi. Um, just to follow up on that, um, 
There were others I need to follow up on. I can yeah. ask you those Others, questions. yeah. We'll follow yeah. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's probably take that one away. <laughs> yeah. Take, we'll that, take point. that one yeah. away. That didn't count. <laughs> okay. Are you ready, Matt? Yeah. All right. This is a Sydney viewer who had windmill grass everywhere last year. Can they expect to have it this year? Yes. It's a perennial. All right. Uh, a Blair viewer overseeded last fall. She thinks probably in September. She's wondering whether she can use a pre-merge this year. Does she need to skip a year? No, should be good. It should have came up last September and probably mowed a couple <laughs> times this year. Pre-merge, it should be good. All right. Is there any way to get only unwanted grasses or grassy weeds out of ornamental grasses without hurting the ornamental grasses? By pulling them or selectively treating them with a non-selective herbicide. All right. Does anybody in the Nebraska area sell seed for zoysia grass? Uh, I'm sure if you contact some of the local seed dealers, they would be able to find it or source it out of state for you. All right. Um, this person wants to know if they can put down grass seed if their homeowners association already put down a pre-merge. Probably not. I would wait a little while before that pre-emergent. Uh, it takes a little while for it to break down in the soil and most likely your grass will not emerge if it is just put down. Okay, and especially if they did not put down one with mesotrium. Yes, it. if they put down one of the common ones, it, it'll prevent the grass. Okay, all right, Jonathan, the, the bar yeah, is- It's very high. It's, yeah, okay. So this is a lion's viewer who wants to know, is there any control for stock borers in the coneflowers? Yes, uh, put a pheromone trap out and then maybe some pyrethroids would help you when you start to see them appear in the trap. All right. This is a Sutton viewer who last year apparently had tons of blister beetles. Can they expect them this year and how to manage? Blister beetles are best managed by a spinosad application or putting on some gloves, some rubber gloves, and then picking them off by hand and throwing them in soapy water. All right. This is a mead viewer that had white flies all over in their garden last year. Is there anything they can do to control it this year? Be prepared. Be on the lookout. And if you start to see them show up, use an insecticidal soap or rub them off with some alcohol on a Q-tip. All right. Uh, this is a Dorchester viewer who apparently had cutworms last year, and they want to know when they should appear this year. So they're on the lookout. They're on the way. They're coming up from the Gulf states. If you get an acelaprin type application on your lawn, that'll take care of them this spring. All right. This is a pilger viewer who wonders how to keep those green worms out of their broccoli. Uh, hand picking. That's the best way. All right. Uh, so those pill bugs, sow bugs, oh, under rocks, do they do any damage to the landscape? They can eat roots sometimes if they get in too high of a population, but usually they're just there kind of hanging out, but they don't cause too much damage. Am I seeing, where is that? It's Am breaking I seeing half. It's a that it's like, did I get it? You Did can, I get the last You can one? hand it back and forth. You can hold guys. it together. Yeah. I'll just take it. Okay. <laughs> I'll give that back. <laughs> John, plant of the week is what? <laughs> you have some beauty. So we have uh, two plants of the week. We have uh, epimedium or barren wart. That's this uh, pinkish uh, color here. Uh, it's evergreen in the shade. It's in the barberry family. Uh, and it's very slow to spread. There's lots of species, hybrids, cultivars of that. It's a very pretty uh, flower, and it is slightly fragrant. I smelled it a... Uh, a little bit over here. And then I think a lot of people would be uh, surprised to know that this beautiful cascading flower here is actually maple. There's mm -hmm. sugar maple and Norway maple. Uh, and people don't realize that they actually have those wonderful, wonderful flowers uh, in the spring. So there's your, uh, there's your maples. Exactly. And, and they are quite different in the maples. And of course, that then creates the wings. But mm -hmm. these are not the ones that wing themselves into your gutters. That's silver maple. <laughs> yes, that's silver maple. So Yeah, very nice. Thank you so much, John. All right, we are pictures next. Oop. Jonathan, this is a Stanton County viewer. She has hostas on the north side of the house, so a little sun. She said they've had this damage the past couple of years. She waters with a soaker hose and they look fine until mid-August. Sure looks like this is some slug damage on these plants. They love to eat hostas, especially if they're in the shade. Slugs, they are sometimes hard to get rid of. Uh, you can use some slug baits for them. You have to be very careful with those because they're hazardous to dogs. So sometimes people would prefer to use diatomaceous earth if they have a dog 
as a pet. It's much safer for everything in the environment and it works very well. Neither of those options are gonna work very well if it rains though. So if there's rain in the forecast, don't put them out, otherwise you're gonna lose that efficacy. The other thing you can do is you can go and buy the cheapest beer possible, like a 58 pack or whatever it is that the college kids buy nowadays. <laughs> I'm not gonna use any brand names, no brand names. Uh, and then you can get little saucers and fill them with beer and the slugs will crawl into it and they'll die. So you can have one for them, one for you, and you can watch them as they kill themselves into oblivion. It's pretty fun. I'm not sure college kids drink cheap beer anymore. No, are they all fancy now? Mm, yeah, but oh. cheap beer is a better option. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, Matt, this is a viewer in Plattsmouth, mm -hmm. has several patches of Creeping Charlie. He used uh, Weed Be Gone for all sorts of stuff about four times last fall, but summer back in green, would it be effective to spray again now to kill Creeping Charlie, or should they wait until fall? Uh -huh. and that looks like henbit instead of creeping charlie but yeah ground ivy or yeah, hen bit one of them if there's both of them it looks i don't know to me it looks Kinda like ground like ivy but yeah um the bigger problem is if you're going to kill it that there's nothing there to compete so there's already seed there or there's stones there from the let's say creeping charlie or mm -hmm. ground ivy so it's just going to come back even if you do kill it so what you need to do is actually introduce some seed into that um and if if you're going to introduce seed you could use another product that contains mesotrion, which would be that Scott's uh, turf builder, or uh, uh, it's for seeding and for weed control, and it has meso in it. And that actually works well on both of those also. And you could get the grass to grow, and that would probably help solve the problem. Because just killing it, it's gonna come back when there's just bare ground there. Um, there's not a lot of turf in the stand. Okay, so they really should do that now, though. Yeah, you right? should do it now. Otherwise, yes, wait in the fall. You could treat it this spring. Um, your product should work, the one you're using. Uh, just make sure you get it uh, adequate supply of it. All right, thanks, Matt. Okay, so I'm gonna toss this to you, Lauren. You might wanna share it with John. This is a Council Bluffs viewer who, nearing the end of harvest last year, had white spots on the interior of their Rutgers tomatoes. Um, flavor also faded. They were wondering, is it a pathogen or is it simply heat and end of season? Oh, well, uh, I'll, I'll talk from the pathogen and then I'll, I'll kick it to John. So one, one of the things that can happen are some of our viruses that affect tomatoes can distort the fruit, can produce spotting in the fruit, um, and, and that's a possibility. Um, John, is that, can that be late season heat or anything that would do that or would you go that way? I think uh, so there could be some heat. Typically you see that as like you get those like white cords through mm -hmm. the tomato, but it could be, you know, that it did that. It, but, you know, it could be the virus as well and it's really hard, you know, tell to tell, you know, you would, you would know virus more if there was some more discoloration or modeling mm -hmm. on the rest of the plant. But mm -hmm. um, so either one of those, there's not much you can do yeah. about it. Right, and rotate your Tomatoes, right? Just rotate, taste, right? Don't well, plant if, them in the same place. That's a good thing to just watch that foliage as it's growing yeah. to make sure you're you're roguing out if you do see distorted growth. All right, excellent, excellent. Well, let's see. Our next thing is still a picture question for John, and that would be one that is a hydrangea, mm -hmm. and they're wondering on this one, John. This is Bloomstruck, which is one of the newer of the Struck series, or the Endless Summer, Endless Bummer. And they're wondering <laughs> on this one when they should prune and what they should prune. So hydrangeas are one of those difficult things because there's all these different, like this one blooms this time and that time, and they all have different pruning times and, and pruning. Uh, so this one, uh, you know, you, you have to, to schedule your pruning because basically uh, it can bloom on both the, the new year's growth and on the second year growth. So you want to watch out because if you're, if you're pruning indiscriminately, you can basically prune out everything that will bloom and you'll end up with a, you know, a nondescript green shrub, basically. Uh, so uh, what you want to do is, is to basically watch and to make sure that you know that all of the buds on that branch have bloomed out before you prune. So that's probably going to be uh, a later summer pruning on that. Right, and if you would, and, and if they never leaf out at all, prune it, prune anyway. Right? Yeah, if it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just don't do it yet. 
Yeah. Yeah, not yet. Okay, good. <laughs> Do something else in the garden. <laughs> All right, well, insects are just like us, many of them, in that when it gets cold outside, seek a warmth and a foody place, right? Hello. Warm and food. So unfortunately, sometimes that means they do want to hang out in your home. Here's Jonathan and Jody to talk about keeping those pests out of your home all season long. A lot of homeowners and business owners are really concerned about the amount of insects they're finding in their homes right now. Yeah, it's not that you're being infested with anything new or anything. In fact, it's that everybody's trying to leave. These are overwintering pests that are trying to get out of your house. They got in in the fall. They were using your house as a nice Floridian type getaway from the cold of Nebraska, but now they want back out in nature so they can feed and they can mate. So we probably didn't notice that they were coming in the fall, but we've got five overwintering pests that we commonly see right now coming out of the woodwork, it seems. <laughs> They're coming out of like light fixtures and windows getting caught where it's sunny. One that's becoming of increasing importance here in Nebraska has been the brown marmorated stink bug. It gets its name because it's brown and marmorated is kind of a fancy way of talking about it being spotted. So it looks a lot like our native stink bugs, except it has stripes on its antenna and kind of a gray belly. It's a pest in gardens, feeds on peppers and corn and tomatoes, lots of other crops. And in the fall, it likes to get into the house and use your home as sort of a heated tree to avoid those winter temperatures. But once inside, they're not gonna feed, they're not gonna mate. They're just waiting out under the siding in the attic and the soffit, trying to wait out those cold, cold temperatures. What about some other ones besides the brown marmorated? Well, one that's in the same order as the brown marmorated is the box elder bug. And a lot of people are familiar with that because they've been overwintering pests for a long time. They're all commonly found around box elder trees or maple trees. Another one is the cluster fly. People get alarmed because they see a lot of them because they cluster together, but it's not an indication that there's something decaying. It is a parasitoid of earthworms. So they're also one of those. And then there's the Western conifer seed bug. They're commonly found around pine trees and they don't usually do any damage to the pine tree, but they are overwintering pests. So you may see some of those as well. I think that's a really good point. When these things get into the house, they're trying to wait out the winter. They don't want to mate. They don't want to feed on anything. And that's important, especially for this last one, the multicolored Asian lady beetle, another common one that gets into the house. So the multicolored Asian lady beetle is a pretty interesting example of this kind of pest because in the summer, we like it. It's a good biocontrol agent. It eats a lot of different aphids that are in the landscape, but it does get into the house in the fall. It can taint wine. It can get into your house and bite you. It can stain things with its reflexive bleeding. And so you definitely wanna try and keep that one out. It's not mating or feeding inside, but it does cause some issues. Some of the things that you can do in the fall are seal and caulk some of the cracks and gaps around your home and siding. You wanna make sure you've got intact windows and screens and seal up some gaps under doors. People always wanna know though about insecticides because they're all about spraying when they see a lot of bugs. What are your thoughts about that? Insecticides can be tough with these kinds of pests because you're trying to create a barrier between them and the inside of the property. And if you put it out too early, the barrier fades and they're going to get in. If you put it out too late, they're already inside and the barrier no longer works. So you got to be very observant. If you've had this problem in the past with any of these pests, keep a close eye out for when they're crawling on the outside. That's a good time to start doing your perimeter spraying. You can also just simply use some soapy water. You'll get the same effect if you see a big group of these insects all hanging out together. So definitely don't panic right now. Get them outside. Don't worry about them after that. Take those pest proofing steps over the summer and you won't have to worry about this happening again next year. Stand by. <clears throat> it might take a while to find all those cracks and holes outside your house, but if you can get them covered up, you'll have a lot less problems with those insect buddies coming inside, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. A weekend's worth of work. Yeah, it's fun. Get outside. <laughs> Soak up <laughs> some vitamin go. D. <laughs> there you go. All right. So we have, uh, speaking of sort of inside, this is an Emerson viewer, Jonathan, who found this thing on a brace during construction. Okay wonders what it is. So this is a potter wasp. Potter wasps are really cool because the female, what she does is she takes sandy kind of clay soil and she bundles it up into this pot like we see here. And then inside of that are gonna be some caterpillars that she has stung and immobilized and she puts her eggs inside of there and they're gonna hatch out and they're gonna eat the caterpillars. And it's the circle of life and it's amazing. Uh, right now they are probably in there pupated, ready to come out as an adult. They are a beneficial biocontrol agent. If you have a garden, they're gonna control some of those pest caterpillars for you. 
So leave it alone. If you want to pop it off very gently and set it somewhere, if you need to do something with the wood, that would be a solution, but absolutely no need to spray or anything like that. Excellent. Those are very cool. I think they're awesome, yeah. Yeah, very cool. All right, um, Matt, this is a commercial site in Lincoln okay. and showing some real issues with the turf, and I know that we talked about it, and you, you two might bat this one back yeah. and forth a little. Uh, you got fairies dancing in your yard, making mm -hmm. round circles. Um, that's what they used to think in the mm -hmm. medieval days, yeah. so I'm pretty sure that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and they would show this early, probably. Uh, yeah. They must have fairy gardens because yeah, they exactly. attracted the fairies, That's right? what happened. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, uh, type 2 fairy ring, I think, is the correct one, where you have the green rings uh, in the turf, uh, and it's greening up just now, so you're going to see these pretty evident in the lawn. Uh, it's a fungus in the lawn, and really, there's not much you can do. Uh, masking it with a little bit of fertilizer actually helps and it greens up the whole lawn and you, those those circles of the fairy ring will kind of disappear and I don't know. Yeah. I mean, is there much that's else? The thing, yeah. yeah, I'd say the fertilizer will mask it. That's about it. All right, give it to the fairies. Yeah, take root. Yeah. <laughs> Stop putting fairy gardens out. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. And on that note, Lauren, <laughs> I know you love trees just so much. Here is uh, another tree I like chainsaws, picture. that's what I like. Yeah, so this is a maple <laughs> on street frontage. That's um, another one. Yeah, and the, that fungus runs all the way up one of those trunks. There's still a few leaves. Yeah, so when you see this type of, and we're gonna call this a sign of the fungus being present in the tree, so that's a fruiting structure of something that's growing inside. I don't know what the specific genus of the fungus is, but anytime we have trees that we have some sort of conch or we have some sort of fungal growth on it like that. Typically, that's a lot of dead wood inside that's being colonized. So trees like this, we worry about them being hazard trees because they are weakened. Uh, that trunk portion that has fungal growth on it's probably completely rotted if you were to, to go inside. Uh, so long term, it's not gonna make it. Uh, it may leaf out, it may be slow, but over the next series of years, it will die. Uh, so unfortunately, that would be another prune at the ground. If you really enjoy it, you can live with it for a few years probably, but eventually it will die. So sorry about that. The other thing I want to follow up on uh, re related to the mushroom question, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, that is actually kind of a sensitive issue. So I really want to encourage people, if you do look into edible mushrooms, mm -hmm. make sure you do that with someone that knows what they're doing. Uh, there are some great resources available to look at and try to identify edible mushrooms, uh, but you still need to have some level of expertise in how to interpret these spore colors and, and, and various aspects of what a mushroom, different, different anatomical features. So just be really careful if you do go into that area. All right, excellent, that's good advice. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially based on all of them up the trunk of that tree. And, and, and some of those, some of these types yeah. of things can be in those edible categories, but you really wanna be very careful. Right. And the right. safest thing is to buy them at the store. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, so we don't know where this one is, John, uh, but she's, and she doesn't know what it is, but it's a dwarf Alberta spruce. She wants to know what is happening to this little guy. Well, aside from there's a guy, I think, creeping in the back of the picture there that I found. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if he had something to do with it, but it's probably winter damage. Uh, so with, with evergreens, uh, we get uh, winter damage from basically drying out rather than the cold. So what happens is, uh, the ground freezes, they can't take up as much water. Uh, the cold wind is very dry in the winter and so we have that wind that's always hitting the plant and it basically dries it out. Uh, and unfortunately with evergreens, uh, anything that dies basically doesn't come back. You can't you know, get it to, to come back. So if you can prune that out and it still looks okay afterward, it will be okay if you, you know, get all that dead stuff out and say, well, it doesn't really look like what I want it to look like, then you're going to have to replace it. All right, thanks, John. And we do have a lot of winter damage this year. So, well, we have a whole bunch of announcements of fun things going on in the gardening 
game world in the next couple weeks. First is American Spring Live, be a citizen scientist at Homestead National Monument, and we've got uh, information <coughs> on the screen for that one. That'll be fun. Our second one is the UNL Hort Club Spring Plant Sale, and I think the Range Club is joining in April 25th and 26th in the greenhouses on East Campus. We have a third one, which is Spring Affair, which is also coming up this uh, April 26th weekend, and that's at the Lancaster Event Center. We have yet another one, which is the Northeast Nebraska Master Gardeners Plant Fair and Market, also the weekend of April 26th up in Norfolk. And I think we have one more maybe, which is the May Museum 20th Annual Perennial Plant Sale in Fremont. So many opportunities. Everyone's wanting to sell their plants. And everybody, <laughs> most of us are wanting to go buy them. So right. how are we gonna make it all the way around the state in one day or less? That's right. All right. So we have a handful of questions and a little bit of time left. This is a Crete viewer, uh, Jonathan, had a peach tree borer, wants to know when to control and with what. He said he did use a drench, but can no longer use that one. The timing can be probably in the next month or so, like later May. You can also make sure that you're timing it correctly if you get some pheromone traps. These are clear wing moths again, so they are attracted to those pheromones. That'll tell you when they're flying and that you want to drench the <clears> trunk <throat> with a pyrethrin down to the runoff, and then you'll be protected for that growing season. All right, excellent. Matt, a follow-up to uh, Bill's segment, actually, sort of. Okay. This, is a, this is a viewer who uh, wants to know whether he can salt his gravel driveway to kill the weeds instead of using glyphosate annually. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I would use salts because it's going to take quite a bit. And then where does that salt go if you have a big rain? It's probably going to spread right into your lawn next to the road. So I would probably stray away from the salt. I mean, it would work, it'll kill it if you go in a high enough rate, but I would say stick with the Roundup or there's other options that have actually residual in the soil, uh, like a ground clearer that holds in the soil for over a year uh, and it'll keep those weeds out of the lawn and it won't be as mobile as salt would be. All right, thanks, Matt. Lauren, this is a Diller viewer who said that last year she had white peonies that were just starting to open and bloom and then the petals turned brown and the flowers never opened. She said the other peonies did fine. So it was just the white ones. Um, a couple of things, that, a lot of times with flowers we see botrytis blight on the flower. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking this is. Make sure you use sanitation, uh, clean everything up this spring, that'll reduce inoculum avoid overhead irrigation. That's what I'm going to recommend based on that. I could be something else, I'll tell you. So maybe if it does sample. it again this year. Yeah, take a picture, yeah, take a closer look. Yeah, sample or something. All right, so. good. Uh, John, this is a viewer who wants to buy a good peach, <laughs> peach tree and wants a bounty of peaches, which we all would love. Uh, any recommendations on variety? So the unfortunate thing is that peaches don't really grow well in our climate. There, there's lots of different you know, cold issues and climate issues. Uh, and then we also have the Japanese beetles, which uh, you know we can blame Jonathan and yeah. Jody. It's, it's all their fault, fault. Right. Uh, that we have Japanese beetles. Uh, but they actually really love peaches, and they mm -hmm. will. You will find clusters of you know 15, 20 Japanese beetles on a peach eating it. Um, that being said, you know, we could, you know, look at Red Haven as one of them. Uh, you could experiment, you know, sometimes it's, it's finding one that, you know, you have to baby it along anyway, what it, so find something that you think you're going to like. But Red Haven would be a good place to start. All right. And variety is fruit stand, is that what it is? Yeah, fruit, fruit stand. stand. Right. Mm -hmm. The go name to of the fruit stand. Yeah. Or go down to Kimmel when the peaches are ripe yes. and hope that they got yes. some this year. Have, them, have Kimmel yeah. grow them for you. Right. Or look at their varieties. Yeah. All right. Excellent. We have time for about one more question, Jonathan, and it's your turn. Look at the split. <laughs> this is a Valley County viewer that has hackberries that are about 40 years old sure. or so. She says black bugs. Now, we don't know how big and okay. we don't know when, but we have black bugs. If she's seeing them right now, it could be the hackberry psyllid, the hackberry nipple gall maker is its other name. It's very common on those trees and the adults are attracted to the tree right now trying to lay their eggs. So that would be my guess on it. All right. And, and no need to do anything about that one. You can rake in the fall and then you won't have to see as many next year. All right, so that's just the way it is. That's it's just the way it is. It's we, call it, we, we, we call it a workhorse, not yeah. a show horse. <laughs>